This is the DeFi and interoperability panel. I really like this panel just because we've got a few folks that have that are running DeFi products focused on end users. We've got folks focused on cross-chain. We've got Noble, which is potentially end user, potentially infra. Uh, I'm curious how Yelena would describe it. Uh, but so I'll just I'll just kind of kick off. Um, Yelena from Noble, Paul from DYDX, Abraham from uh, UMI or UX Chain, Fig from Squid. Um, so just rolling right into it. So I guess um, my first kickoff question is for each of you individually and for your application, um, how are you personally or how is your organization viewing interoperability as solving a problem for your end users or not um, over the next, say, six months? All right. Uh, thank you for having me. It's 9 p.m. here in Denver. We're all think having a good time, so hopefully we can make this panel a little bit interesting. Um, so for Noble, it's very simple. Uh, we've been, you know, Cosmos, Maxis, you know, for many years, and we look at IPC as the standard interoperability framework that all protocols, including Ethereum and others, will adapt to over the coming years. Um, for us, IBC is the gold standard. There is a sort of a meme tweet going around today that the standardized interoperability, interoperability protocol for all blockchains will not have a native token. That's IBC. Um, so really, that's kind of what we're focused on. Yeah, I think for DYDX, interoperability is as important as product experience. And I think probably the most interoperable aspects of the chain are, are probably Squid and, and Noble USDC being able to do like really easy cross-chain bridging. Um, but yeah, the goal is to just abstract away interoperability and, and kind of just what the infrastructure you're trading on. Like when you onboard a DYDX, you're using MetaMask and like an ERC-20 wallet or like a Ethereum wallet currently. Um, and we plan to like add for other chains in the future. But with CCDP using Squid and Noble, you can basically on any origination chain bridge assets directly uh, to DYDX chain. So I think interoperability matters as much as like having a good seamless product experience for the user. Hello. So UMI or UX currently supports over 30 assets uh, across 25 different blockchains. So we have a unique insight into building cross-chain applications. Um, so the problem is for cross-chain applications has two parts. Um, or it, this is how we're looking at it, essentially. One is how do you build a good cross-chain user interface? And two, how do you facilitate fast and frictionless cross-chain transactions. So essentially, how do you make a cross-chain application feel like a normal application on, say, like Ethereum, right? Um, what I'm talking about is, is similar to what Paul said. Essentially, we're, we're abstracting the bridging completely. So imagine a future where UX integrates Squid and Axlar directly onto the chain. This means that we can bridge and supply to UX in a single step and in much faster intervals than, than currently available. So you could bridge supply to UMI's lending pools uh, with a single wallet using XR GMP Express and MetaMask Snap all within 20 seconds. Um, so that, that's a very dramatic change. Right? right now, you can do it in like 10 to 30 minutes, and you have to do all a bunch of different steps. You have to jump through MetaMask and Kepler, so it's really complicated. So we're abstracting bridging away and essentially abstracting UMI away to the end user. So any user on any chain really doesn't feel that they're interacting with a different app chain. They're, they're just working off their native chain. So yeah. Thanks. I think we've started to think about interoperability as between users and applications. And you know, we started off thinking about cross-chain communication. How do you get a message from A, chain A to chain B? But in all of these cases, we want to get a user to an application, user A to application B, and or user A to user B. We're just trying to get um, agents to be able to transact between each other on blockchains. And 
so the work we're doing at Squid is purely just building these tr complex transactions into one click, um, allowing you to have a token on Avalanche and go through the Cosmos through Noble into DYDX, or if you're in the future, you'll have native Bitcoin, and then you go through Bitcoin into Arbitrum, then into Osmosis, then into UMI, and you land all in one transaction. We're trying to think about this interoperability, not as these individual steps, but as the, the pure like, end to end point. And users and even developers shouldn't have to think about what's in the middle, it's just getting straight to the core application logic and, and being able to build what you want as fast as possible. I think just like one more thing to, to consider is a, a very capital efficient way of routing. So getting from point A to point B in a way where you know, you're not losing money, there's no slippage, you're not writing through an AMM, and just being able to do that in a very seamless way is super important. Yeah, quickly too. Um, and so that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I think you, you might notice the thread in a lot of these responses is UX, right? How does the user get to what they want to do as quickly as possible and with as few clicks and as little pain as possible? A lot of what we've been approaching so far, I think, in the Cosmos ecosystem is bridging, asset bridging, and making sure that the IBC DNOM ends up in the right place. And We've spent so much time on it because it, it is actually a hard problem, but when you kind of think about it, that really is just, in my mind, the first step of where we can go. Um, and so one way that I like to think about this is, for example, on DYDX, you're thinking about the problem from the standpoint of a user coming to do, to do perp trading, right? And you want users to be able to onboard as quickly as possible. But then suddenly, you are the most successful perp trading decks in existence, and you have this incredible asset, which is a large number of perps, which could get used elsewhere. And I think about inter-protocol, right? It, you know, inter-protocol might want to purchase perps to hedge against liquidations, or it might want to do a delta neutral minting mechanism or something along those lines. And what I'm really excited to see is sort of the next evolution of this that gets us beyond token bridging and swapping, which it, again, is difficult and is like the bleeding edge of what we're able to do right now, but more towards protocols speaking to each other. Um, and so I, I guess when we, and it doesn't have to address that point necessarily, but I'm, I'm curious for your own protocols, what is sort of the, the thing that you might be working on on that point? And Yil and I know, for example, Noble, you, you had a long talk about this. Maybe one of those points that you mentioned earlier around what Noble is doing to try to make sure that routing works well, USDC can get to the right place, or new assets. Yeah, yeah I mean, for us, it's very straightforward. We want to find the most capital efficient route for assets cross chain where they can land on Noble and then be automatically you know, forwarded or routed through the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem. And to do that in a capital efficient way is actually much harder than you would anticipate. Uh, obviously, when you do something like issue native USDC on Ethereum, there is this pool of liquidity and this standardized asset that can be leveraged by any application, which is awesome. But in Cosmos, it's obviously very different. And so for us, something that we've done um, is integrate um, uh, as the first non-EVM chain uh, to integrate the cross-chain transfer protocol, which is Circle's native bridge. And so this is a one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, transfer mechanism where you can burn a USDC on Ethereum, for example, mint that on Noble, forward that to a chain like DYDX, and you know, um, use that asset as, you, as you'd like. Um, I think in the monolithic architecture space, we've sacrificed uh, a few things that we've gained in, in, in Cosmos. And you know, there's the same kind of trade-off in Cosmos. We've gained a lot in Cosmos that we've sacrificed from a monolithic perspective. One of those things that we've gained in Cosmos is obviously like sovereignty and per permissionless interoperability. But one of those things we've sacrificed is actually that seamless UX. And so that's really what Noble has tried to achieve in the Cosmos kind of context. Um, so that's something I would say from an onboarding perspective, we're really proud of. We're trying to make that experience similar to a monolithic you know, environment where you have this one asset that's av freely available on you know, dozens of hundreds of blockchains at once, um, but at the same time, the backend sort of infrastructure has to contend with the fact that they're all sovereign kind of chains that are all interoperating um, you know, 
in, a, in, a, in this sovereign way. So um, that's kind of what we're trying to solve for. Yeah, plus one to CCDP being probably one of the best product experiences in Cosmos to, to help for interoperability and just like product experience generally. Um, What's beautiful about perps is you really only have to worry about bridging over the collateral and then obviously the native token that's used as a security token for validators. Um, and I guess eventually what would be cool is to like have, I mean, some smart contract en enablement for you to automatically call a smart contract to hedge positions like you mentioned. But I spend probably 30% of my time on the product partnership side just focusing on onboarding because if you solve the onboarding issue, it doesn't really matter what chain you're on for hedging, right? You can just basically onboard easily, seamlessly, a quick amount of time, really cheaply, and then you can just hedge any position that way. And that's kind of the whole reason why DYDX pivoted to this app chain, to have kind of autonomy over having these off-chain order books in a decentralized fashion, but also just being able to have this one chain that we could grow as our infrastructure for the future that everyone onboards to hedge out positions, trade new markets, et cetera. Um, so I think that's probably the, the onboarding is probably the biggest thing we're doing for interoperability. I think there's a lot of cool things you could do with other smart contract enablement, like built vaults, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's in the future. So uh, for UX 2.0, to add the, the new product that we're currently building, we actually took a lot of inspiration from DIDX's onboarding. They, they really abstract the Cosmos chain portion. And for an Ethereum user that's simply just coming on MetaMask, signing a couple of transactions, it's, it's a very smooth process. Um, but where UMI fits is it, it can be on the initial user onboarding or it could be in between strategies. So we're really, uh, we have to look for specific strategies and where we fit in. For example, like restaking apps. We're, we're, a lot of our TVL is, is in LSDs right now. And so you, a lot of people stake their, LS, stake their uh, native asset and then supply it to UMI, uh, leverage up or uh, supply it to pools. So the, it's really about looking for those particular strategies. Um, so yeah. For us, the next step is really just expanding the chains and tokens that we support. Um, we want to create, keep this programmable money characteristic of, of the cross-chain stuff that we do because it could have been very easy for us to just be a cross-chain swap protocol or a bridging aggregator or something, but every, every token which you receive on any chain with Squid, you can also receive a payload to execute some application logic. So we're just trying to keep expanding to as many chains as possible, many tokens as possible, but retaining this ability to do these, like, to compose applications across chains. That's all. That makes sense. And so, uh, from from my perspective, thinking about it now with an Agoric hat on versus an Interprotocol hat, um, you know, from an orchestration standpoint, you're hearing a lot of we we need user onboarding to be seamless. We need it to be seamless. And one of those pieces is sometimes onboarding requires multiple hops, right? So you might need to do a CCTP transfer to, to Noble from Ethereum or wherever, and then have that then do an IBC transfer and then do a liquid stake and then do a supply to UMI. That currently can't be done without smart contract orchestration, at least from our, from our research, right? There isn't enough IBC memos you can give to make the, those follow-up transactions happen. And Fig, correct me if you've seen different, but it is, it is quite challenging to do these multi-hop um, transfers that do things that are, that are um, complicated beyond just a transfer or a swap. Um, and so if you're looking at building orchestration kinds of applications, that's where I would be looking first, right? There's a lot of really low hanging fruit of just saying, okay, well, I'm gonna link these two applications together in a way that you can't just do with a basic IBC transfer. That can happen on Agoric smart contract, which then helps all the applications that then benefit from it, right? There's one framing of this, which is there's a whole of, bunch of work to do user onboarding you can also think about it as like programmatic onboarding, right? Like how do you onboard smart contracts versus people? And that's sort of a way to also boost your revenue and, your, and, and how you're thinking about your chain success. Well, I mean, it's funny because in like the traditional like SaaS world, like any kind of um, UX friction is like a, you know, retention kind of vulnerable, like, you know, point where you can, it drops off. And we, we assume because people are super excited to ape into the next thing that they'll just deal with the friction points, uh, you know, and, <laughs> you know, kind of just, uh, 
be okay with it, but it's actually not the case whatsoever. And so obviously, you know, something that you described with the orchestration kind of smart contract mechanisms, like that's, that's definitely a part of it. And like the kind of meta idea is like this intense based system where you can sort of in, you create an intent to create these, you know, very complicated workflows as the user to see your, you know, asset go from point A to point whatever in a seamless way. So um, there's definitely a long way to go. I mean, every day I interact with these systems just to test them out, honestly. Like, for example, recently I was testing out Tether on Kava, which, you know, Tether as like the other kind of dominant stable in the crypto ecosystem. I mean, it's, it's you know, these assets, it's funny, these assets, like from our perspective, it's the difference between getting like the US dollar in like Canada, let's say, which is like, you know, where I'm from and like very close counterpart to America versus getting like the US dollar in like, you know, Africa. You know, it's like, it's, it's actually the same asset, but it's a completely different user experience where it's different infrastructure, different onboarding, different rails, different, you know, KYC mechanisms. Like it's the same asset, but it's actually a completely different experience. Um, so in crypto, we actually contend with the same sort of friction points where, you know, you think you're interacting with the same asset, like something like a stable coin or, you know, something else where w when you're not, you're, you're actually not like it's, you know, maybe like at a fundamental level it's the same asset from like a redemption perspective, but like from a actual like UX perspective, it's completely different. So something to consider. Yeah, I don't know if, if I have too much to add here. I'm getting told. I'm getting paid. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Enjoy the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs>